It, it looks like this side over here is gaining on us here, okay? Praise God. All right. This, this, this side over here is slacking. And these two right here are coming up in the middle. Get it? All right. All right. Sounds good. Yep. Yep. We hope you had a good day. Praise God for his rest. Praise God for his blessings. He's kind of turned the thermostat down a little bit, hadn't he? You do know he controls all this, don't you? Amen. Yeah, okay. Praise his holy name. See, if it was us, you'd be 70 over here, you'd be about 85 over here, and we'd blow up, you know. <laughs> Praise God. He's a perfect weatherman. I mentioned to you this morning on a more serious note uh, that Ralph Triplett passed away. Pray for that. We praying for that family, lifting them up in your prayers. Ushers, you come on down tonight. Father, we just thank you for the privilege, the joy to give to invest in eternal things that we know that are going to last forever. God, the most important and the best investment that we could make is in your will, in your work, in your kingdom. Father, we thank you for the jobs you give us and the homes and the resources we have. It's so abundant. We just praise you, God. You're an abundant God. We pray for the triplet family, Lord, that you would just give them grace and peace and comfort during this time. Meet their needs, Lord. Father, we thank you for the, the opportunity to worship you and to open your truth tonight, your, your words tonight. Speak to us, Lord. Don't leave us like we are. I pray stir us up and move us to that next place you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Isaiah 6-3. Take your hymnal and turn to page 67, Holy is the Lord. This will also be on the screen. Worshiping with page 326, your name. And really sing out about the name of Jesus.
page 441, the potter's hand. Let this be our prayer. Praise the great God of glory. We need to be a worshiping people, continuously giving ourselves up to the glory and majesty of God. God is a perfect God. He's perfect in His love. He's perfect in His righteousness. He's perfect in His holiness. He's perfect in His compassion. He's perfect in His works. He's perfect in His word. He's perfect in all He does. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. When we focus on the Lord and worship Him, ascribe worth, honor, glory, and majesty unto him, we're changed. We're changed from glory to glory. Church, we're living in a time where people have lost the majesty of God. They've lost the wonder of God. We want to bring him down and make him like us. 
He's not like us. He is holy, different than us, set apart different than us. He's God, and we're not. He's the creator, and we're the created. He's the master, we're the servant. He's the shepherd, we're the sheep. Oh, God, I pray that he would restore a sense of awe and wonder and majesty to my heart, to your heart, to the Christian community. Because when we see him, like Isaiah, when we see him high and lifted up, we see ourselves properly and we see each other properly. But until then, we try to pull him down. We try to box him in. We try to make him like us. He's not like us. Remember God's conversation with Job? Oh, Job got put in his place. Oh, God, help us to see you high and lifted up. That's just on my heart. Not part of the sermon, but we need to see God afresh and new. Maybe through the sermon tonight, you'll see him afresh and new. We're looking at... God in the life of Jonah, and Jonah is mad at God. You ever been mad at God? Jonah's mad. He's mad at God because he didn't get what he wanted. Have you ever not got what you wanted? Some of you husbands are smiling. Welcome to the real world. Amen? You know, it's just a matter of giving up and working together and giving up and working together. The more and more you get in line with God. You know, you start out, you're a single person, you get married. You got to give up. Amen? Then you you come to know the Lord. You got to give up. Amen? Amen? Then you go down to that local church and you join that church. You got to give up. Amen? And it's just a continual giving up and working with other people and sacrificing and becoming so beautiful in the eyes of God. Amen? Jonah didn't want to give up. Jonah wanted what he wanted. And now he's mad. Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Chapter 3, a revival happened, and here God's prophet is pouting. God's prophet is displeased. God's prophet is angry, not only angry, but very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarsha, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil." Therefore now, O Lord, take my, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. For it is better for me to die than live. My goodness, Jonah, what's so bad? Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? In other words, Jonah, do you have a right to be angry? Do you have a right to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth, a shelter kind of thing, and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. Jonah's just sitting there and thinking, come on, God, I know you're going to destroy. I know you're going to wipe them out. You know, and a revival's just happened. What is going on in Jonah's head? You know, Jonah... Preached the right thing, but he didn't have the right thing in his heart. Are we like that sometimes? We're good with our words, but where is our love? Amen? And the Lord God prepared a gourd. I love this story in the Bible. God can do whatever he wants. 
And he, he does some, he goes really far out there a lot of times to help us. <laughs> Amen. I mean, think about this story and the, the far reaches that he goes to minister to us and disciple us and transform us and to make us like his son Jesus. And the Lord prepared a gourd, made it to come up over Jonah, and it, that, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smoked the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a venomous east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and he wished in himself to die. Now this is the second time he's wanting to die. And said, it is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? Come on, Jonah. And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh? That great city we're in are more than six score thousand persons, 120,000 children, that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. Many commentators say at this point, boy, it had been great if Jonah ended on chapter 3, a great revival. I'm going to tell you why it didn't end at chapter 3. Because God saw fit to have chapter 4, because we need chapter 4. Amen? And chapter 4 is there, not in some weird way. Chapter 4 is there because God's still working with his man. God's still working with Jonah. And this whole book begins with God large and in charge. And it ends with God large and in charge. God's the sovereign God over the universe. He's just taking a man here and calling him out, calling him in the ministry with a task, and the man's being unwilling to do the will of God and the work of God. And we see in the story, 1, 2, 3, 4 of Jonah, God has his ways to get us right and get us focused and get us busy for the glory of God. It may take a worm. To eat our gourd sometimes. And if that's what's needed, he'll send a worm. Amen? Now what's that worm look like? We know what it looks like in Jonah's life. It was about comfort, wasn't he? We get comfortable, don't we? We like comfort. I like comfort. But God showed Jonah an object lesson. A real life lesson. That he's sovereign. That he wanted to have compassion on the souls of people more than he wanted somebody to have comfort. Jonah wasn't getting it. He valued his own comfort. He valued his own people more than other people. He wanted God's mercy, but he didn't want God's mercy for people that wasn't like him. He was racist through and through. And God was helping Jonah with that. And God helps us with that. Amen? Jonah is angry at the Lord. Wednesday night, we looked at number one. Jonah is angry because God didn't destroy Nineveh. Verse 1, verse 4, verse 9. And if you'll remember, Jonah wanted justice on Nineveh. Jonah preached judgment on Nineveh. Nineveh repented, and God saved them. Jonah was angry. He was under, under, in, anger, in anger so much that the word anger there means to boil. 
It means to boil. He was so angry about it. You ever been angry about something? You did something stupid, said something stupid? Well, all of us, yeah. Anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. It's dangerous. That's why Scripture talks about it. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't let the sun go down while you're mad. Really, we apply it a lot in uh, marriage. But it, it, it needs to go out into all of our relationships because anger doesn't bring about the righteousness of God. Here, Jonah should have been compassionate. Jonah should have been forgiving. Jonah should have been merciful. But instead, he was angry. He was all centered on his own desire and his own way. Jonah, he's angry because God didn't destroy Nineveh. Number two, let's move on. Jonah is angry because God is merciful. Oh, my goodness. Why would you be mad? Because God is merciful. You see, God loves the best for everybody. For everybody. He treats everybody the same. His mercy is the same for everybody. My Bible tells me loud and clear that whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. There's no stipulations. There's no uh, qualifications to that. It's whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The rich, the poor, the educated, the non-educated, whosoever. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever call, uh, shall believe in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The invitation goes out to all. Not a select few or group of elite. God would rather forgive than judge. Do we have that kind of heart? Hmm. God's standard of mercy is consistent for all. God's standard, His character. And Jonah knew this. Look in your Bible in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2. He knew it when he was in his own country. He said, I knew that thou art gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. He knew it in his head, but he didn't want to accept it for other people besides Israel. Turn to Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6. God's the same. God's not changed. Here, God's revealing Himself to Moses. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Think, take your Bible and look in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7. Jonah is angry because God is merciful. I'm glad God is merciful. I'm glad I haven't received what I deserved. It would be a devil's hell for all eternity. But I'm pleading the mercy of God. Because of Jesus Christ dying on the cross to satisfy the heart of God and the judgment, the, the justice of God, we can be justified before God. We too need to be merciful. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You know, it's kind of like that verse in the Bible about forgiveness. You know, if we forgive one another, our Father forgives us. If we show mercy to one another, our Father show mercy to us. But we get in this double standard thing a lot of times. We want it for ourselves, but we don't want it for others. And this is what Jonah's doing here. He's got a double standard going. Turn to Romans chapter 9 in verse 15. God has the right to do what He wants to do, when He wants to do it. He's the sovereign God of the universe. For He saith to Moses, you know, we talked about the potter and the clay here. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. Amen. 
Well, what do you do with that? I'll tell you what you do with that. You are God. That's all you can do with that. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So God tells Jonah to go preach to Nineveh. Go preach the uh, judgment and destruction is coming, and they repented, and God showed mercy. Turn to Ephesians 2 and 4. The Scripture is so full of verses about God's mercy and how we should be merciful as well. But God, which, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us. concept of mercy in the Old Testament is, is to get into the shoes of another person and walk for a while their road. When's the last time you did that? It gives another perspective, doesn't it? Instead of judging them real quick. Instead of condemning them real quick. Try to get in their skin. Try to get in their shoes from their point of view. Mercy. Titus. Uh, no, let's, let's look at uh, 1 Timothy 1.13. Here Paul is, is a focus. Who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, an injurious, but I have obtained what? Mercy. Because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Titus 3 and 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Mercy. Mercy. Aren't you glad for the mercy of God? By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Hebrews 4 and 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's for somebody tonight. It's wide open. The Father is wide open to you. You need mercy. You need grace. It may be in your marriage. It may be in your parenting. It may be in your job. It may be in your finances. It may be in your attitude. We get a bad attitude sometimes. Amen? We get cynical. We get judgmental. We sometimes get like Jonah, don't we? And we know we're messed up. And we need somebody to help us. And we know it's not those around us. It needs to be a higher power. Not a human being. God. The God of our salvation. So that verse is wide open. God is wide open tonight. There's a throne of grace for us. Because of the mercy of God. I am grateful that the Father pitieth us like an earthly father pities his children. Hallelujah. Mercy always forgives. Forgiveness unties the knot and sets others free. We must own the knot first. Mercy always wants the best for others. All the time, in all circumstances, for all people. Mercy. No exceptions. You start making exceptions, we're not like God. Amen? Look at the unmerciful servant in the Bible. And this, this story is still etched in my mind from Johnny Hunt's conference last year. By the way, the men's conference is coming up. God speaks to our hearts in a big way when we get away and get down there. I pray, do it again, O oh Lord. 
Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew 18, 23. This story of the unmerciful servant, we, we just can't believe somebody could be like that. But at the same time, we know we're like that sometimes. And we need help. And there's a throne. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. And But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had, and payment be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. No, there's no way he could pay this debt. This is millions of dollars. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant that just got loosed and forgiven and shown mercy went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. We're talking few dollars and millions of dollars. And he laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, Thou art. O thou wicked servant, should he not call us something similar if we're not willing to forgive? I forgave thee all that debt, an impossible debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldn't thou, shouldn't thou not? Also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wrought and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. Here it comes. So likewise shall my Heavenly Father, do also unto you, if ye from your hearts, that means genuine, forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Jonah and the Ninevites, Assyria, forgive, forgive. You and I, forgive. Brother Tommy, you just don't know what somebody's done, what somebody said. It's been this, it's been that, it's been this, it's been that. Nothing will ever be as big as that. All of life is to be lived with that as our backdrop. Our example, turn to Ephesians 4.32, Our example is Jesus. Our Savior is Jesus. Our Redeemer is Jesus. And be ye kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We've got to treat people like God has treated us. We've got to pass it on, pass it forward, and be like our father. Jonah needed to do this. Number three, Jonah is angry and wants to die. Verse three. 
So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh. Wrong verse. Jonah 4 and 3. Therefore now, O Lord, take I beseech thee my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. What is going on with this prophet? Well, think about it. How does Jonah look in the eyes of Israel right now? They don't like the enemy either. And here Jonah obeys God and goes and preaches. Do you think Jonah's going to be accepted very much with Israel now? Since they believe, since they hate their enemy also? Where's Jonah going to go? Jonah don't look so good right now, does he? My friend, that's what happens when you play both sides of the fence. We need to line up with God and live for an audience of one. And then it don't matter what everybody else says. But when you try to please these people and try to please these people, you ending up pleasing nobody and especially God. We need to please Him. And then if he or she is pleasing Him, we unite. Let God be true and every man a liar, Scripture says. Here's Jonah. Jonah knows in his heart. Excuse me, Jonah knows in his head what he's preaching, but he does not know in his heart the heart of God and that God loves everybody and is consistent for all people. Reminds me of Peter. Also, at one time, living two standards. You know, he wanted to eat with the Gentiles and eat what the Gentiles eat. But when the Jews come around, oh, no! He had two different standards going on in his life. Folks, when we have one standard, then we can live with integrity. Our lives balance out. Turn to Proverbs 3 and 5 and 6. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. To trust in the Lord means to, if you go back up to verse 1 in Proverbs 3, is to trust His Word. Trust His Word. Cling to His law. Cling to His commandments. Don't get into leaning in on your own understanding. Okay, I know what God's Word says, but if I'll just please this person, make them happy, because I don't want to be mad at me, you know, if I stand up for what's right. Baloney! You'll be doing that everywhere. It's called situational ethics. You'll be going around trying to please everybody. Just please God. Just live by His Word. Let His Word be the plumb line, the north star of all you do. And everything else falls in place. Here Jonah is, is angry. He wants to die. God's got him. God's got his best interests at heart. Even though his own people are still hating the enemy. Notice number four. Jonah is angry for no right. No right, he's angry. Verse 4, look what it says. Then said the Lord, Dost thou well to be angry? Do you have a reason to be angry, Jonah? Now I want you to think about the logic here. God is creator, God is ruler, God is provider, God is protector, God is redeemer, God is forgiver, God is life giver. God is sovereign over the universe. Jonah? Who made you God? Perspective. Amen? Jonah needed to hear Romans chapter 12. I don't know where it's at. It's in Romans. I'll know it when I get there. Amen. Romans 12, verse 3. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. 
Jonah, you, you're not to come out here and, and come up with the standards and change the rules. I'm God. You're my called prophet. You're on mission for me. I love everybody. You've already uh, said I'm slow to anger, gracious and merciful and kind and repentance thee of evil. You're out here all mad and having a pity party because you didn't get what you want. It's not about what you want. You need to be like me. You need to be like God. We looked at this verse earlier, at least one of them. Turn to Romans 9 and 18 and 21. God's a sovereign God. He does what He pleases. Therefore hath He mercy on whom... He will have mercy, and on whom he will harden. Verse 21. Hath not the potter power over the clay? Don't you have power over your car? That's about the reasoning going on here. Of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? We need to get up into his reasoning and get out of our reasoning. His ways are not our ways. When we talk about verses in the Bible, God works all things together for good. We need to define good. Because our good, many times, is having it made and being comfortable and getting all we want. My friend, that's not God's definition of good. And I'm in the same boat you're in. And I wrestle with this just like you do. Sometimes that means a worm to eat my gourd, to wake me up. Sometimes that means suffering and sickness and disappointment and struggle, and difficulty, and persecution. And I'm not saying bring it on. I'm just saying this is reality. It comes into our lives. And what we have to do is reach up out of all that miry pit and grab a hold of the hand and the heart of Almighty God and trust Him even though we don't understand it. Because He has declared who He is. He deserves absolute trust because He is the absolute perfect God. And every day we need to wake up to that reality. And every day we need to believe that away. Jonah, you have no right. You have no right to be angry. God is working meism out of Jonah, selfishness out of Jonah, his own beliefs out of Jonah. And that's what God's doing with me. That's what God is doing with you. It's called developing, maturing, and growing, and becoming more like Jesus Christ every day. That's the road we're on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, it's tough, it's it's difficult, we don't understand everything. But He knows what He's doing, and you can trust Him with everything. Worry less and live more, amen? That's what it's about, hallelujah. How do we do that? Grab a hold of the promises of God, the character of God, the sovereignty of God continuously, continuously, rejoice in the Lord again. I say it again, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice, rejoice. Philippians 4, 4, where was Paul when he said rejoice? He was in prison. Rejoice, watch this. Don't rejoice in your bank account. Don't rejoice because you're getting free coffee. Don't rejoice because you're getting these perks and these benefits. Don't rejoice that you're getting this and that and things are just going your way. Rejoice, what's it say? In the Lord. 
What is it in the Lord that I need to be rejoicing? My sins are forgiven. And I'm in the family of God. I have the Spirit of God living in me. And greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. If I died right now, I'd go to be with Jesus for all eternity. And the goodness and the good times have just begun. My friend, we need to get an eternal perspective on life. And quit being so temporal and now and present in this old world. Because... We're just in a little speck of time compared to eternity. We're going to be living with God. No wonder Paul had the mindset that he had. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord again, I say. To live is Christ. To live is Christ. To be right here with Jesus. And to die, oh, it's gain. It's going to be even better. I'm going to see him. I'm going to see his nail-scarred hands. You know, here I'm, I'm, I'm walking with the Lord. I'm walking with the Lord by walking with his word circulating in me. That's practicing the presence of God. His word is his presence. But one day I can see him. Face to face. Face to face. Eternal perspective. Jonah. Jonah's angry. He's angry for no right. No right. Look at number five. Jonah is angry and reaping his fleshly ways. Oh, I tell you, you're talking about a pity party. Here it is. Look at verse five. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. He knew what would become of the city. God's a gracious God. God has sent revival. Just maybe God will take them out. He's mad. He's pouting. You know, in my own personal life, I have noticed every time, every time without fail, because I believe he's having a pity party. I've noticed every time that I start focusing on me. Oh, I've been mistreated. Oh, somebody's talking about me. Oh, this is happening. Oh, my family. Oh, my children. You know, I've noticed every time I start that line of thinking, it's nothing but a nasty pit. I, I, I mean, it's, there's no joy there. There's no victory in Jesus. It's just nasty, discouraging, and it just keeps getting worse and worse the more you think about it. That's what's going on with Jonah. And here he is. And we'll get to this later. He's out here. He builds him a little shelter. And the, the heat, commentaries tell us the heat is up to 120. I mean, it is blazing hot. And that's why the gourd is, God sends a gourd. He wants to comfort him in his distress. So God sends him some comfort. And it ain't long till God sends him some discomfort. What do you need? Some comfort or some discomfort? Oh, Brother Tommy, I can't believe you say that God would send discomfort to somebody. I don't know what world you're living in, but it ain't my world. And it's not the biblical world. God's going to do whatever it takes to make me like Jesus. And he's going to do that in your life. As Peter would say about trials and tribulations, as need be. As need be. That's individual. And 
I may need a couple of worms and you only need one. I pray not. But you see what I'm saying. And you say, oh, God would never do that. Look at the Bible. Did God do it in Jonah's life? Who do we think we are? Amen? The Bible says God loves us, and those whom God loves, you know it better than I do, those whom God loves, He chastises, disciplines. Boy, we talk about children this morning. Oh, what a greater subject, amen? <laughs> a lighter subject, yeah. Show that video again. No, I'm just kidding. Um, parents, no parent in their rightful mind just lets their kids do whatever they want. That would be mean. Because we know what the results of that is. We know. We know what the results of that is. It, it doesn't teach responsibility. It doesn't develop character. It doesn't set them up for success. And competence in a giving and a caring heart toward others. And, and we're just frail creatures of dust trying to do this parenting stuff. Amen? He's a perfect heavenly father. He knows exactly what discipline to give for what bad behavior. Sometimes we don't get it right. He never gets it wrong. Never. Oh, okay, you don't want to witness. Oh, okay, you don't want to, you, you want to come to church. Oh, we might get to preaching here. Uh, you you want to come to church, and, and you just want to sit on a pew, and you don't want to give. You don't want to tithe. You don't want to support the church, and you don't want to pray. You, you just want to come to church and you want to sit there. Okay. God immediately goes to work on that person to help them become a faithful, loyal member of the body of Christ. Amen? Just immediately. Oh, okay, you, you don't want to read your Bible. You, you don't want to take the effort to, to find it, <laughs> to, to pick it up and to open it up on some kind of regular basis. Oh, okay, okay. Here comes these big things in your life. Shh, boom! God, help me. Shh, boom. God, why help me? Shh, boom. After a while, I want to know God more. I want to walk with God. I want to do things His way and not my way. You, you can't do that without reading, pondering, meditating, having His Word circulate through your mind, practicing His presence by carrying His Word with you wherever you go. Let's all stand. Jonah's mad. Are you mad? <laughs>